Major Lindsay in Africa presents Erasing the Stigma, conversations about mental health in the legal profession. Welcome to Erasing the Stigma, conversations about mental health issues in the legal profession. I'm Mark Yacono, your host, and this podcast is brought to you by Major Lindsay in Africa, the world's largest and leading legal recruitment firm. I am thrilled today to have a great guest, Lisa Smith, who is a former lawyer, a former law firm leader, and the author of a phenomenal book called Girl Walks Out of a Bar. Um, She is a mental health advocate and a substance abuse advocate and works tirelessly to promote wellness in our profession. And Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell the uh, listening audience a little bit about yourself. And thank you for being here today. Great. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm honored. Um, So my story was, um, I I think, a pretty common one. I was was kind of a a big drinker, partier, whatever you would refer to it as, uh, growing up through, you know, high school and college and into law school. um, I had a genetic predisposition to uh, substance abuse and mental health disorders um, in through my uh, both sides of my family and I became a first year associate at a big firm um, in back in 1991 and I became a nightly drinker at that point. It was it was in my first year of practice that I became a nightly drinker. And that started a, a spiral that lasted close to or about a dozen years downward of where I went from drinking um, at night basically to, you know, I didn't I didn't really I wasn't fully aware of why I was doing it or or what it meant, but I know now looking back that you know it was my way of, of coping with the stress and the anxiety that I had, and um, it, it sort of followed from being at night to um, finding people who like to drink at lunch, and I started drinking at lunch, and at the end of my slide, um, the last sort of 18 months had gone down into um, basically 24-7 drinking, and with that cocaine, which I mixed in um, to counter the effects of the alcohol that I had to drink to get out of bed. So um, if you're not familiar with that as a listener, um, what a lot of what cocaine does is sort of nap you back into an alertness um, after drinking. So when I was so physically addicted and physically sick in those last um, several months, if you saw me in the morning before I had had a drink, which I had to have on my nightstand when I went to sleep, um, and I would be shaking and sweating and, and just look very sick, you would think, you know, that, that's a sick person right there. Um, but once I got the alcohol down, shakes would stop. I could pick my head up off the pillow. Um, But then the alcohol effects, I would be kind of woozy and not in in a state where I could function um, in the office or working from home, which I did quite a bit. And so I would use cocaine to counter that, those effects. And so if you saw me after I had sort of calibrated myself in the morning, you would say, that looks like a normal person. And that was that was how I functioned at that point. Um, I was very fortunate that I um, hit my own bottom in 2004, one Monday morning on my way to work. Um, and I was having, I, I had this feeling just like come over me while I was on my way to the elevator and up from my building in Manhattan. I was working, I jumped over to the administrative side of the law firm. Um, many years earlier when basically I felt like my drinking had become incompatible with becoming a more senior associate. And um, I became overcome on my way to the elevator. And I thought in that moment that I had, you know, maybe overdosed or I was having a heart attack or, but that was going to be the moment that it was all over for me. And I know now I was having a panic attack, but something in that moment, um, led me to ask for help and 
um, I knew I was sick enough to need um, to need a hospital stay to do that, and that's what I did. And um, so then, I'm uh, one thing I wanna I wanna kind of talk to you about as I read your <laughs> read your book, and I, I hear your story as we talk today, and I think it's really relevant to some of what we see in the profession. You were a uh, you had a sophisticated legal practice. You were a fairly high-ranking member of firm management. And to, to people who didn't know you or only knew you in the work context, you were a very functional per person on the outside from what I read. 100%. Yeah, I never even got a negative comment on a, on a performance review as a lawyer or after I jumped over into administration. Um, I was, and that's why one of the reasons that I feel really strongly about um, raising awareness of, you know, somebody does not have to be uh, really in, in bad, you know, in clearly in bad shape to the rest of their work colleagues for them to be really struggling and in a bad place. So as you look back on the experience, do you think if it were in a more in a time where people were maybe more tuned into those types of issues, that you were there, there were signs that could have been seen, that you were displaying behaviors that might have, you know, five years later, led someone to think maybe you were dealing with a problem or problems. Um, possibly. I mean, the biggest thing that I think changed in me, and a lot of times when somebody starts really going far down the scale. Um, changes in behavior, changes in appearance even. Uh, but I started to work from home a lot. Now, a lot of people did in my office, and the person I reported to was not in my office. Um, so that alone, it would, it would really have to be something that somebody was really on the lookout for because there really wasn't anything unusual about that. Now, when I was, I was ex extremely painstakingly careful to calibrate myself when I had to be in a meeting, in an office in a meeting, or in the office in a meeting. And I did, you know, I was working at the time um, in, in client development, and I was working directly with partners. Um, so I tried, but whether or not, you know, somebody might look more closely at something like, um, you know, my, I don't know, my clothes, like, or something about um, maybe smell something and pay more attention to that is possible. But well, I was, I was surprised I when I read your book that when you just, when you got to that point where you couldn't get on the elevator and it was a, it was really a haunting part of the book where you thought you were going to die and you realized you needed medical detox, that when you called your friends, even your own social friends were kind of surprised. That, oh, yeah, so. they were. They were because, you know, one, one of the biggest indicators of somebody kind of having a problem is that they isolate, right? They, they shut out everything. And, you know, I could calibrate myself, okay, where I would be with my friends and go out to dinner. And, you know, my friends drank. My friends didn't have problems like I did. Um, but, you know, we'd all have drinks. We'd all have that, whatever. It would be a good time. And then they would go home, we'd all go home, and what they didn't see was that I would, you know, shut my apartment door, pull out another bottle of wine, and continue drinking. Like, for them, the night was over. They had no reason to think that I continued. And my family, too, you know, my family I was very close to. They didn't realize what was going on with me, and, you know, a big part of that was they, they, live, they live in New Jersey, and, you know, ever since I had been a first-year associate, there were a ton of times where I would have plans to go see them, and then at the last minute I'd say, I'm not going to make it. I have to work. So when I would say that to them as I was bottoming out when I just couldn't get there, they really didn't, you know, pick up on what it was. Like, it, it might have, to someone like me who knows, you know, who has seen it and lived it, they, maybe they could have picked it up, but certainly someone who's never – been in that situation, it was fairly normal behavior for me to cancel. And even I, you know, having gone through what I went through, I have missed things in other people that I have been close to. So, I mean, it, it can be very hard. 
So one of the things that struck me was something you said at the beginning of the podcast is, when, and it's, it's really detailed very starkly in your book, is when you went through the medical detox, um, really at the end of that, your doctor, you know, suggested and it, that you actually had clinical depression and that in many respects you had <laughs> engaged in a pretty destructive but profound self-medication regimen yeah. with yeah. alcohol and cocaine. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I guess the question now is first, can you share with our, our listeners how many years sober you've been? Sure. I had 15 years sober on April 4th. Um, and um, yes, and that was, that's, that's been through the process of the detox. And then, and we can talk about this a little more, but I, as you know, from the book, I refuse to go away for long-term inpatient or longer-term inpatient treatment because I was afraid of what, you know, my law firm finding that. I was afraid of the stigma. Um, but I did go to intensive outpatient at night, and I began immediately doing 12-step at that time, and I still do that today. Um, it's not for everybody. There are other ways people do things, and that's fine, um, but that's the path that I've taken. So I know that you, you say – on your website and in, in some of your um, public public comments that you also take your medication religiously. Yes, 100%. Um, I was diagnosed in the, um, in the detox. There was a psychiatrist who came in and spoke to me each day and, you know, kind of, why do you, why do you drink this way? You, you know, going into my whole history, all of this. And I really had started um i was a i was a heavy kid and i had a um i started out really abusing food first as the first substance i got comfort from food particularly sweets and basically after speaking to me for that those four days he said to me the psychiatrist he was like okay listen i think that you have crossed the line where you can no longer talk safely so, and that's how I treat it today. So you can't go back to drinking. But I think you were drinking the way you were and using drugs the way you were and probably even using food the way you were from the time you were a kid as a way to self-medicate what has never been uh, diagnosed in you before, which is major depressive disorder. I think that's what you have. And going forward, you're not going to medicate it with drugs and alcohol. You're going to medicate it with appropriate antidepressants. And he put me on that immediately. And I know that that, and I still take them today and I will the rest of my life. I did an experiment on trying to see if I could go off many years ago because I wasn't sure what part of feeling better was sobriety and what part was the medication. That experiment didn't go well. I'm not going to conduct it again. So um, I know that it, it's a lot of people kind of feel like they would dread getting that kind of a diagnosis, I was thrilled. I, I was relieved. I was like, oh, you have a name for it. There is something I can point to as, as to this thing. And you've got a way for me to treat it that means I don't have to drink anymore. Sign me up. Let's, and let's I, go. And, and I th that's I think what there's I did. A, and I think there's a really nice um, message in there because there's been a tendency to stigmatize the taking of medication. But from yeah. your experience, and, and I can say from personal experience, I ran the same type of experience experiment that you did, and it went profoundly poorly, is that depression is a condition, a biological disease in many instances, and taking medication just like you would for high blood pressure or for um, mm -hmm. controlling some other chronic condition isn't anything that anyone should be ashamed of. No, um, absolutely not. And that is one of the big things that um, I really try to um, emphasize when I speak because, you know, there we do need, and, and the ABA has said in, in its published um, work and, and recommendations on lawyer well-being, that to be a good lawyer, or, and I think to be a good anyone, you have to be a healthy lawyer, meaning 
physical health and mental health. And, you know, these addiction and mental health disorders, they're disorders of the brain the same way that, you know, it, it is the brain is an organ of the body the same way the heart is an organ of the body. If I had heart disease, I'd go to a cardiologist, I'd take blood pressure or whatever medication they told me, and I would do the things uh, in my life, make whatever behavioral modifications like diet and exercise that to help control my uh, heart disease. I have a, a disorder of the brain, just another organ. I see, I see a, psych, a, a psychiatrist still. Um, I... So an appropriate doctor, I take prescribed medication as prescribed to address the, the problem with that, that organ struggles with. And I do things um, lifestyle-wise, whether it's diet, exercise, not drinking, meditation, whatever sleep. it is, sleep. to complement that. Sleep. Yeah. Sleep. Sleep's one of the best medicines that we have. And I think sometimes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, 100%. 100%. The law firm culture sometimes overlooks the therapeutic and life-sustaining benefits of sleep. Yeah, and, I mean, the studies have shown that people who drive sleep-deprived are as impaired as people who drive drunk. So it is, you know, the idea of work hard, play hard, power through it, and, you know, all these all-nighters, your brain, it's not, it, 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 it's a, it's a, a critical thing for your emotional and mental health, but it's also something you're not performing at, you know, at your best when you've been sleep deprived, 100%. So in your consulting practice, you work with law firms on wellness and mental health and substance abuse programming and messaging. Um, is there any, in your view, has, it, has the mythology of all-nighters and the iron, iron man, iron woman sort of archetype of mm -hmm. what it takes to be successful, is that beginning to, 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 to evaporate or dissipate some as, as the I, science, the data comes into focus? Mm -hmm. I, I do think it is beginning to, and I, you know, all forms are, are different and, you know, it's, it's a cultural thing as much as anything. Within firms, but I do think overall firm cultures are changing and moving in that direction. And I think, you know, a lot of it is based on what we've seen in the studies and what what the research has shown. But a, you know, a really significant part of it is being driven by the more um, junior lawyers coming up the ranks who have, you know, who who are not interested in signing on for that kind of a, of a life. Um, you know, they are, it's going to become an issue where if firms aren't uh, paying attention and making, uh, making it so that it's an appealing style of life to, nobody's saying not work hard, but to have that sense of you are chained to your desk and it's a 24-7 thing and, and, you know, it's, the longer you, the longer the longer hours you put in, the better you are. That's not going to attract uh, the best and the brightest going forward. And I think they're seeing that. And it's not going to retain the the younger lawyers that are there now. Do you have any uh, point of view on whether or not the demographics of firm leadership, either generationally or gender? or ethnicity-wise have any relationship to whether the firm's progressive about that type of um, what I would call work-life sensibility? I don't really, um, other than what I do think we are moving, you know, I, I don't have enough to, to make a meaningful statement on that, but I, I do think that we are moving into an environment now where people are, including firm leadership, are a lot more fluent in the language of uh, substance use and mental health uh, disorders, and therefore are sort of more sensitive to that. It's not, you know, I felt like 15 years ago when I was struggling with this stuff, and I was terrified that my firm would find out, and I didn't want to tell my firm because I thought I'd be judged and this and that. You know, 
I don't know what what people what the people you know kind of knew what their experience was. Now I know you know that when you go into or when I go into a firm or anyone else goes into a firm, you've got in senior management all the way down people who have seen family members and you know law school roommates never it is um, struggle with these issues um, there is because over time there has been more and more conversation about it unfortunately some of these problems have gotten a lot worse um, they don't discriminate so they hit everybody and I think now we're in a you know no one ever would have uttered the word you know depression or anxiety is some sort of health diagnosis 20 years ago in law firms you know, now it's discussed all the time. And I think that goes all the way up. That is definitely encouraging. And I can share with you, I was in Phoenix last week, or the week before, it's time, time is blurring um, for me these days. Yeah. And um, the American Association of Corporate Counsel, the ACC, actually, mm -hmm. actually has formed um, a committee and a working group on mental health, wellness, and substance abuse issues, and, and, and they did a session at their annual meeting for the first time, I think, and I was talking to some of the, the lawyers behind it, and what struck me was how they've looked back and had colleagues that were struggling, and in retrospect, they could see it, and how they wish they knew what they knew now then, because maybe they could have yeah. been maybe they could have intervened and in, in helped guide to a different outcome. But the one thing that struck me was the degree of compassion and the desire to guide people away from a bad outcome. And I think, at least personally, that that is a pretty big paradigm shift that we ought to be hopeful about. I think that's absolutely true. And I can tell you that when my book came out, the firm that I was at when I had, when I bottomed out, um, you know, I went, I told them that morning, that Monday morning when I decided to get help, I, the first thing I did before um, calling my family and my friends was email the firm and say, listen, I had a medical emergency. I'm going to be out this week, but everything is fine. I'm going to be in the hospital, so I won't be in touch, but I'll see you next week. And, you know, please don't worry about me. And I knew that I could be out sick for five days, but I knew that on the sixth day, I would need to produce a doctor's note, um, and I wasn't willing to do that, and I certainly wasn't willing to go away, so I went right back to work, and I never said anything about it, and, you know, about 10 months later, I left. Um, I got a, a, amazing, when you get sober, I got a bigger job at, a, at another firm, and I never, so I had never said a word, and then, you know, when my book came out, I didn't know how people were going to respond at that firm. And what they did was they invited me in immediately and had me speak to all lawyers and all staff and talk about the book and the issue and all of that, not talk about the firm, but to educate everybody. And they, the people that I, you know, I was face to face with the people that I had been you know, in that shape around at my worst. And they all said, we wish you would have said something. We would have wanted to help you. We're so sorry. And they don't want anyone else to go through this alone. So, so I, I mean. What, 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 can you remind me when your book came out? Uh, 2016, June of 2016. So in June of 2016, you basically have to tell colleagues and peers and friends that knew nothing about what you had gone through because it's about to become a, 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 a right. widely read, highly acclaimed book that was going to come <laughs> out, basically putting your whole life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, mm -hmm. out there for the public to consume. And it sounds like the reaction you got then was different than the reaction you feared you would get when you decided to take that five-day leave. Exactly. That was the reaction that I got then in June 2016, and that was what, because a lot of the people were the same people on the administrative side. 
and they were saying, we wish you would have told us, you know, we cared about you. We would have helped you. We, we would have, we wouldn't have judged you. And, um, you know, that was really powerful. And, you know, like I said, they had me come right in and speak to everybody. They were right up front about it. And when you did that, what was the um, response from everybody? Did, did, did it help some people to realize they might need help? Um, did it generate any sort of recognition or creating? Well, it, it only, yeah, it, I hear things anecdotally. So I always tell people, and I've spoken at probably 20 firms now, maybe more. Um, and I all, I hear from, um, from people, I give them my personal email for anybody who wants to reach out to me confidentially. I frequently hear from people after I've spoken at a firm and I will often hear from people, um, the, the people who organize the presentation or something like that when I, when I, um, run into them or, or whatever, when we catch up and very frequently it is. You know, people say that it really at least sparks conversation and, and leads to, okay, what do we do next as a conversation, which is huge to me, and that it has, you know, helped people not just to come to, you know, re reach out to help, for help, like through HR or something like that, but it has also sparked in them people wanting to be come forward in their own firm and say, I'm here if anybody here at the firm needs me. Um, more and more, and I think this has been a you know, really important development, that um, more and more attorneys in their firms are saying, you know, yes, I, um, I struggle or I have struggled with, um, uh, with a mental health disorder or that, you know, I am in recovery from a substance use disorder. I think that that's um, terrific that you're able to get both continued dialogue at the firm level, but you're also able to create sort of an avenue. I almost look at it as a, as a pressure relief valve on a steam fitting for, yeah. for, people, for people who hear you talk and, and you sort of give them a way to siphon off that steam and at least begin to reach out to someone that they have no reason to fear so that they can, you know, right. at some point kind of kind of come to a, a decision about what they need to do in their life. That's yeah, been, and I do think we see it in the increased numbers, the lawyer assistance program, you know, all of the things that have been around all of all of the the work people are doing in this area, the lawyer assistance program that each state bar association has, had seen an uptick in use and in, in utilization that more people, and that's just part of the broader conversation, I think. Yeah, and it appears that state bar associations are really becoming activists on this issue, that they're doing a lot more state and local yep. bars to create assistance programs, to create support groups, to, and, to, and to fund them. I was just going to say that, um, you know, the, the lawyer assistance programs in the past have been sort of these groups that would come in, maybe it's during orientation for new lawyers, and, you know, they would talk about this, it would be a big blur, and it would be something that people really didn't register, and, you know, then they'd be gone. And firms were, you know, wouldn't necessarily be inviting them in over and over and having that continued conversation. And now I think all of the attention um, that these issues are getting has really um, elevated them to a really great place because they're they're in a terrific position to help. I know when I speak, uh, um, most of the time I would say I'll do my presentation, but there will also be somebody from the local lawyers assistance program to talk about the services that are available. Then, but I also think that it that the sophistication of the organizations has grown tremendously, both in terms mm -hmm. of bar associations and even employer assistance pro EAPs, employee assistance programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember 25 years ago reaching out to the EAP at my firm back then and really being told, well, there's nothing wrong with you. 
Um, yeah. You don't need help. Mm. And and 20 years later, I was to you know receive some fairly yeah. start, startling news about my own brain. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that would happen today. And I certainly think that the bar associations on a state and local level are committing resources and expertise so that they can actually be resources and provide provide support, which 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 to yeah. me is highly encouraging. Yeah, there, yeah. There was a there was a a point in time when you finished your your medical detox and and. The physician that was treating you wasn't very happy that you weren't going to go into a, a 30 day or longer intensive rehabilitation program. And there was also, at first, you, you seemed to have a strong hesitancy about any type of therapy, whether it be through a 12 step group, whether it be seeing a therapist. And I know there's a lot of people who still feel stigmatized or afraid to seek therapy, but at some point when you walked into that room and you decided to keep going into that room, something clicked that made you do that. And I guess really for people who are searching for how to get over that fear of asking for help or going into a therapeutic environment or a support group, what was it that clicked for you that made you kept taking those steps into that room to sit in those chairs and, and start having those conversations? For me, it was um, it was both when I went into the, um, the the intensive rehab at night. You know, I agreed to do that because I was I was curious. I, I I felt so much better physically having been detoxed that I was willing to, you know, try whatever came next. I hadn't, you know, really planned on long-term sobriety at that point, but, you know, I knew how much better I felt like for the first time in, in 10 years, like I was, I went to sleep as opposed to passing out. And, you know, I started waking up instead of coming to. So for me, the physical transformation, Formation was a huge, um, a huge eye opener for me. But also, when I went into those rooms, I heard people who sounded like me. <laughs> there were some. I mean, a lot of them um, didn't have my story. I had a different story than a lot of them. But the things that were coming out of their mouths were things that were would have been rustling around in my brain. You know, like when there would be. You know, I just realized that that their brains worked the way I did, and I all of a sudden I felt very comfortable. Like, oh, I belong here. Oh, these people understand me. The same way the the psychiatrist gave me relief by telling me that you know I had major depressive disorder, I got relief in those rooms and wanted to go back to those rooms because those people were clearly had brains that worked the way I did, mine did, which was, you know, a little off <laughs> when untreated, um, but they were happy. They were successful. They had relationships. They had great jobs. They, you know, were tight with their family. I had thought, you know, not drinking in my case, like that's the end of the world. Like I'm never going to not be a drinker. That's ridiculous. And then I go into these rooms and hear all these people who aren't drinking and their lives are like hugely better and they're happy to be not drinking. So for me, I was like, oh, this is, I, I got a real strong feeling of I have found my people. Or I had always felt, you know, slightly misunderstood before, before that. I think that you just hit on a really important point and, and it's one that I think that mental health professionals uniformly will agree on, which is, when you went through that process, it really normalized your depression and it normalized oh, yeah. your, like, your it substance was no big abuse. Deal. And I think that one of the treatment modalities that, that physicians and, and mental health care providers are trying, especially with respect to men and the epidemic, the mental health epidemic among uh, men is that they are trying to normalize it so that they understand that there are high performing, successful people who struggle with a biological disease and they're not an outlier. 
And it strikes right. me that that's what you experienced when you actually took that step forward to recognize you're just a person with a problem, but there are plenty of people with the same problem, and it's, it's okay. Right. And it's okay, and there's hope. It gets better. Yeah, I, I think that that is um, a really powerful message. And I guess, in, you know, as we come to near the end of our time, I'd love for you to share the kind of work you're doing, um, both in terms of advocacy and uh, consulting, so that the listeners can get a view of really the kinds of people out there who are who are trying to address this issue and and and, and be sources of expertise and and support. So if you could, um, I, I won't call it self promotion, but if you could sort of <laughs> share some sure. of the great work you're doing, I, I think people would love to hear it. Oh, thank you. I I feel really really fortunate to be able to do it. Um, I have, as you know my background, I have kind of a um, unique sort of set of experiences having been an associate in a big law firm and then having been on the administrative side of the big law firm. And then, you know, in, I, I just left a couple of months ago my role as deputy executive director of another AMLA 200 firm where I sat on the management committee um, for five years. So I've been in management for, for a long time. And I've also, you know, struggled with these issues, gotten better in, in my time, but, you know, while, while working in big firms the whole time. And so I, I feel like I have, I can help with, uh, you know, not just sort of telling my story and breaking stigma, which is what I've been trying to do since the book came out in 2016, but also trying to help um, firms work on what kinds of programs they want to put in place, how to get people, the right people and the right um, teams together to develop and implement approaches and programs that can improve not just attorney but staff, obviously, well-being. And um, many firms now have been taking the pledge to advance lawyer well or attorney well-being, which is what the ABA uh, task force on attorney well-being has put out, and it covers staff as well. And it's anybody, any firm that's signed that, there's a seven-point program that they have to actually execute on. And so, you know, I've been able to help provide advice and and some some, you know, suggestions and working through how to comply with those seven points because it hits all kinds of things that I think it's helpful to have someone who has been, you know, sort of at the top ranks of law firm management as well as understands these particular um, mental health issues working on. So, so that's really been what I've been doing, um, doing with firms. It sounds like you've been seeing a lot of progress and that you're finding hope as you do your work that, that things are changing. That's the message I think I've taken away from you is that you're very hopeful and positive about what the profession's doing to start to address some of these issues. I really am. I think, you know, we have a long way to go. It's going to be a long process, but I see commitments at the bar association levels, at the firm levels. Obviously, the ABA is, is, is so committed to it. And, you know, recently I spoke a couple weeks ago in New York at a, there was a program at the forum that Thomson Reuters put on for COOs and CFOs on these issues. And, you know, two years ago, you wouldn't have had a, a session on well-being at a COO, CFO meeting of, of law firms. And, you know, it's that kind of thing that it is permeating every level of the law firm now that I think is a really good thing. And Lisa, I think that is a very hopeful and great note to end our podcast today because it's a strong, positive message. And I want, you know, the listeners to realize that while this issue is getting a tremendous amount of attention, the efforts of people and in, 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 in organizations to address the issue are having an impact and, and things are getting better. I am really yeah. great for you um, spending some time with me and for the time we spent prepping and for you writing that book and, and 
all you've done to shed light on this issue and all you're doing to address this issue. It's, it's been an honor to have you, and I'm greatly appreciative, as is Major Lindsay in Africa. So thank oh, you thank very you. much. Thanks so much, and I'm, I'm just thrilled what a wonderful thing that you're doing this podcast. You know, this is, this is really um, a, fantastic, a fantastic thing that you and Major Lindsay Africa are doing. I'm honored to be with you. Well, we're honored to have you, and for our listeners, I, I encourage you to follow Major Lindsay on social media. Our recruiters and employees throughout the company are doing some very compelling writing and work, sharing their stories, sharing their perspectives, making themselves vulnerable because mental wellness and, and, and emotional health in the legal profession are really, really important to us as a company. And we're seeing some terrific, terrific um, work product and thought leadership all the way across the globe from people who are been more than willing to share their stories and make themselves um, uh, vulnerable in, in hopes of helping things. So listeners, I encourage you to follow Major Lindsay and, and, and read some of that wonderful work of my colleagues. This has been Erasing the Stigma conversations about mental health in the legal profession. My guest today has been Lisa Smith, and I thank you all for listening. Discover how Major Lindsay in Africa can help you navigate the legal landscape at www.mlaglobal.com. <laughs>